and here I am with Joshua Hill you or are. Josh Hill. Hello. Your name is Joshua, right? Yes. Like the full name? It is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Some people were laughing when they called you Joshua Hill. I'm like, that doesn't yeah. mean probably. Okay. Uh, well, hey, Josh. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while here it's at been I a Take while. the Black Live. It's been yeah. a minute. A song of Ben and Josh, mm -hmm. the show where we, Josh Hill and I, go over yeah. every chapter of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, chapter by chapter. That's right. Breaking them apart, breaking them down. What makes them work? What makes them not work? Why are they good? Why are they not good? What makes them tick? We are on the second to last chapter of A Game of Thrones, the first book in the saga. Yep. Catelyn, nine, right there. Josh, do you want any beer? Uh, no, I'm okay right now. I, here's very strong. You it's were, very strong. You were giving strong. it a very good endorsement, though, so You've I feel like people should go like out and drunk, get like everybody else does. some King in the North. This is always good. I do like it when they... Do you think that they're going to continue coming out with Game of Thrones beer after the show's over? Um, they should. They had like a plan for to make four. Like okay. These are the Royal Reserve Collection. This is the final one. Okay. They had a, they had a Daenerys-themed one, a Tyrion-themed one, a Cersei-themed one, and finally, a Jon Snow-themed one. And I don't want to get confrontational, but I feel uh -oh. like whenever we drink, I always drink the most, and <laughs> I always leave feeling like I shouldn't have done that. So I wish other people drank more. It's well, it's well after noon here, though. So it, it would be different if yeah, we were doing so this at like 9 in the morning. some of it. So I should just drink it straight out of the bottle. You should. I encourage that. Let's do it. <laughs> people say hi, by the way. Julie says hi. Linda says oh, hi. hi, Josh. And this says bye, Cheryl. Oh, and Renee has that ornament. Very nice. Very if nice. anybody else wants it, Wick Club. Caption contest. Have a good time. <laughs> okay. So we are talking about the second to last, second to last chapter of Game of Thrones. Catelyn yeah. 9. Well, why don't you just uh, go away with it, Josh? What happens in this chapter, basically? Uh, a lot of uh, more politicking, more table setting for... A lot of more table setting, For yeah. the sequels. Um, we have this big thing about, you know, we get uh, Ramsey Bolton comes into play. We got... Uh, Renly, we've got Joffrey. There's a whole confrontation here about. Mainly, the thing is, Catelyn is coming to terms with Ned's dead. Mm -hmm. We've got to deal with this now because she's all of a sudden. There's a power vacuum in the North. Yes. How is this going to get filled? Who has? Who is the rightful heir to the throne? Who's the rightful heir to the be the king in the North? This is a whole thing, and I didn't dislike the chapter, but it reminded me of. A couple of chapters before, we were talking about how it kind of felt like the last 15 minutes of the second movie in a trilogy where you're like, okay, <laughs> this isn't final. We're clearly setting, we're window yeah, dressing totally for what's going to come next. I didn't dislike it, but I couldn't disassociate that from it. I was like, okay, let's, I didn't rush myself through it. I was like, all right, let's go. Let's just kind of yeah, I, I completely get you. to it. This, this chapter is, it's just Catelyn and Rob at Winterfell. Mm-hmm. Just the heart of the chapter is this discussion in the hall, right, of what do we do now? Yep. And it, it, you're right. It does feel very interstitial. Mm -hmm. But there is stuff to dig into. Yeah. Like I said, like the, so the, 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 the heart of the chapter is this discussion in the Great Hall about, okay, we've won some battles. We're fighting the Lannisters. Rob is kind of leading this ragtag army of northerners and people from the Riverlands. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? And there are a bunch of arguments put forth. Yeah. Like, there are, like people suggest different things. Like, one dude, Mark Piper, I don't know who he is. Um, Could you Lord, imagine being in Game of Thrones, and you're like, oh, I'm going to get this really badass, awesome name, and you're Mike Piper, Mark Piper? <laughs> it's like, well, it's spelled with a Q, M-A-R-Q. I help? mean, that's like, dumb. that's... <laughs> Insult to injury. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> not drink for that. <laughs> there you go. Mark Piper. Okay, so he suggests joining Renly. Yeah. He wants, okay, we're fighting the Lannisters. This Renly guy has declared himself king. Let's join with him. We can join forces. We can beat the Lannisters if we combine forces. Mm -hmm. Rob rejects this argument. Yeah. Why does he reject it? Do you recall? He thinks it's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, but why? You tell me, Dan. Okay, I will. <laughs> okay, so Rob basically says, I mean, so the, the, the suggestion is bend the knee to Renly. Renly's declared himself king. Mm -hmm. Bend the knee to him, join him, and we'll, we'll clean house. And Rob is like, Renly's not the rightful king. Stannis is the rightful king, which is, by the way, exactly the reason Ned would not help Renly. When he asked Ned, he was like, you're not the king, dude. You have an older brother. He's the king. And what's interesting about that is that we have the exact same conflict that Ned went through, which is this mm -hmm. means versus end thing. Yeah. Like, we all agree that we want to get rid of the Lannisters. We want, we want Joffrey off the throne, that we want to 
you know, get rid of this terrible ruler who executed Rob's dad and was just an all-around jackass. Mm -hmm. But there's people like Mark Piper who are saying, okay, so we want that. Let's bend the knee to this dude and do it. But Rob, exactly like his father, is very concerned with doing things the right way. Mm -hmm. Like, he's like, yeah, that would help, but it's, it's not done according to the rules. Renly's not the king, so we cannot bend the knee to a guy who isn't the king. Which is interesting, because as we know, Rob will meet this, kind of the same fate as his father. He'll end up dead at mm -hmm. the Red Wedding. And we see him kind of making Ned's mistakes here, or at least invoking their spirit. Yeah. He is, he does not want to do something that's outside the bounds of what is done. Like, you know, I could bend the knee to this guy who says he's the king, but the rules don't say he's the king, and I play by the rules. And so I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And this, it's, it is a little ironic that that's the route that Ned went. It's almost fitting in a way. It's exactly. I mean, again, like Renly approached him and was like, help me. And he's like, no, you're not the king. I can't. Yeah. It's, 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 you're, you're not playing according to the rules. No, and it's kind of nice that the, the book bookends on the idea that the Starks are so loyal to following the rules, that they are Love so rules, by man. the book. Love it. That it's not just the undoing of one of them. It's the undoing of, I mean, unbeknownst to us at the time, but like, as we know, like you said, the Red Wedding, it's the undoing of like the entire family. <laughs> like, mm. they're trying to play by the rules. Completely. Everybody goes down because they're trying to play by the rules, with the exception of John, who is not a Stark. So <laughs> yeah. that's how that works out. So, and then Arya. I mean, and, and then Arya. And who he does is, go down, John, eventually, because he plays by the rules. He does. He just gets lucky and has like a necromancer near him to and the one and, and, and the two children who don't play by the rules well Arya doesn't play by the rules to begin with and Sansa she, gets there Sansa gets there just in time and I think with her it's an example of we've seen it's the rule of thirds type of thing where you <laughs> with her you're like oh god this is going to happen again I can't believe this mm -hmm. and then she snaps out of it right away whereas Arya straight from the jump isn't going to play by the rules <laughs> and it's no surprise that she's one of the most interesting characters and she's a badass so and then you have John, who's not a Stark and Still, because I mean, of the tutelage goes he, down the same path. He, yeah, he, totally he eventually does. follows the rules. So it's almost like this rule following is a disease. And I have to wonder what George R. R. Martin thinks about authority That's and following the point. rules yeah. if all of the characters that play it by the book end up getting killed in very violent ways. Like, it is, it is not subtle to get your head chopped off. It is not subtle the way the Red Wedding happens. But these are the people that play the rules, and this is the price they pay. No, I think it's totally so, right. I think, yeah, th th there could be a great PhD <laughs> thesis on what they say about authority. George Martin definitely seems like, like he, he is not committed to the, the means are all that matter. No. He definitely, if, if we're to read A Song of Ice and Fire, George R. Martin's statement on political philosophy, he is okay with being extra rule guy That's a occasionally. Doozy. Yeah. Like you should not follow the rules all the time because if you do, <laughs> look what happens. Okay, you literally but, get your head cut off. So, so Mark Piper's suggestion isn't the only suggestion that comes up. Mm -mm. Catelyn, who, by the way, Julie says that Catelyn wants to be king in the north. I disagree, Julie. Interesting. Because Catelyn makes the suggestion in this chapter. Yeah. Her idea is, let's have peace. She makes a case. She's like, I wrote something down. Wow. Okay, she's like, uh, I will mourn for Ned until the end of my days, but I must think of the living. If I must trade our four Lannisters for Arya and Sansa, I will call that a bargain and thank the gods. Basically, she's like, we've lost, they've lost, let's get Arya and Sansa back, trade the Lannister prisoners we've taken in these last few battles, and just go back to the north and just try to live our freaking lives. Mm -hmm. That's her pitch. Is that wisdom? Should Robert listen to that? Uh, it's not a bad idea, but my question to you is, do you think it would have worked? I don't think it would have, because you can't trust people in, in Westeros no. to do the right thing. And that's almost a playing it by the book type of thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a lazy, it's a lazy out, where this is a hard decision that needs to be made. And she's like, well, let's just choose peace. Let's take another easy way out, which opens them up to getting walked over. Because <laughs> you, you give the Lannister prisoners back. You think the well, Lannisters I mean, are going to say, thank they you, want the, they, it's they, peace. They want to make an exchange. She wants to give Lance prisoners back in exchange for the Stark prisoners. For they Arnie do, but it's a mistake trusting that the that that would lead to some sort of peace. That that would lead to that that wouldn't lead to somebody saying, "Oh, I'm going to take advantage of this," which is ultimately what would happen. Gotcha. Because we've seen examples of that through the entire book of 
one thing being proposed, and it seems like the right thing, even when it's not a buy the book thing like Ned does, and we have a complete backlash, it completely backfires because somebody else is like, there's a loophole in this. I'm going to take advantage for myself. It's the little finger thing. Sure. Like little, there's always a little finger in a situation. So you do this, there's literally a little finger in this situation who can screw this all up. So I don't, right. while the idea of peace is nice, I don't think it's plausible. I, Fair so, something no, that, that, that's perfectly fine. So, okay. So you're, you like the rest of that room is not really on board Catelyn's peace train. No, because in she, theory, but not in execution. Sure, because she suggests it, and everyone is like, no. <laughs> They're all like, we got to get revenge. Let's do it, do it, do it. Like, no one is into that. Mm -hmm. And she has this moment where she's like, like she's thinking like, well, I tried. <laughs> and she just like sits down. Like, they're not going to listen now. Oh, we're all so screwed. <laughs> Which, I mean, again, they are, eventually, we know they are screwed. Yes. So what solution do they come up with? They don't take either of those options. They don't do peace, and they don't bend the need to readily. No. Instead, should I just say this, or can you tell me Spoil what, what ends up everybody. happening? Spoil it for everybody. Go yes. for it. Okay. Um, the solution they come up with, I believe, suggested, I've got to suggest it, um, declare Rob the king in the north. <gasps> you know, they're not going to bend the knee to Renly. We don't like that king. They're not going to have peace. There's been too much bad blood. Mm -hmm. So the one dude, I forget who it is. Is it Karstark? Stands up and just says, you know what? I'm not going to bend my knee to this guy or that guy. I'll bend my knee to Rob. Mm -hmm. He's been a good leader. King of the North. King of the North. King of the North. They had this whole. It's actually very much like the King of the North scene from the show with Jon Snow. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is interesting because in the, in the books, Rob's King of the North scene happens in like a forest mm -hmm. where they're like at a camp. And they all just kind of rally and raise their fists and whatnot. And here it happens in River Run, in a yep, great hall, Run. which is kind of like how it happens in uh, Game of Thrones, the show. Mm -hmm. So what did you think of that move? It was very rousingly written. It was, and it goes back to the whole window dressing thing. Where, I mean, it's not a bad suggestion, as we've come to find out. I forgot this at the time when I was reading it, but and you routinely remind me of this when we're talking about it afterwards, <laughs> but Rob's... A, teenager he's like 15 he or something is. Rob like is that. young. so the idea that the best plan you can come up with is let's make the teenager king in the north whether or not he's the rightful heir or not is mm -hmm. an interesting choice to me well i mean i i uh, about the teenager stuff i mean he is 15 in medieval in fake medieval times yeah. so it's like you know 15 back then is more like 25 now or whatever <laughs> and they had different different times different times but i mean it is also a compromise between the two suggestions. Like, they don't want peace because mm -hmm. they're all too angry. And they don't want to bend the knee to Renly because apparently that's against the rules. So, fine. We're, we're kings now. Basically, yeah. they're seceding from the Union, what this is. Mm -hmm. They're saying the North is independent. The North shall rise again. And uh, that's what we're going to do. And, I mean, as written, I, I, I think it's, it's pretty inspiring. And it's supposed to be. It's supposed yeah. to be like a Shakespeare, Braveheart-type rah rah all right moment in hindsight we know it all ends spectacularly badly very badly yes but uh in the moment it's it's pretty fun yeah okay any other thoughts on that no i mean it, i did get the braveheart-esque type of rah rahness <laughs> from it but yeah it, it, it's it's hard not to read it and know what's happening yeah, afterwards true. like perhaps if you were coming in fresh i'd have a different perspective of it knowing that it all ends literally in the worst possible way yeah. is it kind of puts a little damper on the I mean, moment but, but because isn't it like in in stories like you're trained to like this guy to yeah. like the guy who's gonna be the leader of the people yeah. is it gonna he's rising take up it? yeah he's rising up he's not gonna take he's the, gonna the stick big it to the man smacking you down he's gonna yeah. topple the evil tyrant yeah he's gonna win like we're supposed to like we're supposed to be behind that person and we are mm -hmm. just the twist is when <laughs> that person doesn't do anything he Intends to do and dies. But that's in a couple of books Violent, now. violent death. <laughs> right. Uh, the other bits of this chapter are, like, that's, that, that's like, I, I think the, the, the reason this chapter exists is yeah. to give us that King of the North scene mm -hmm. for Rob, because that's huge in the next couple of books. Mm -hmm. um, the ancillary stuff is fun, though, too. This is Catelyn returning to her childhood home of River Run. Okay, my first question for you is, um, are you interested and as julie says they love a good chant which is very true yeah, that's true the northerners can't get enough chanting <laughs> um are you into all the architectural dorkiness that george R. R. martin throws around so river run he goes into some detail about yeah. how 
it's built it's a triangle castle it's it's surrounded by rivers on all yeah. sides it has this ability to kind of uh through a system of dams flood all the area around it so it's basically in a lake mm -hmm. um you know what it reminds me of it, it reminds me of like um like movies that go into gun porn a bit or that like love talking about yeah. the intricacies of gunplay yeah with the, like fast and the furious movies where they're talking about like how many horsepowers the thing gets mm -hmm. yeah like all the carburetors george R. martin loves this kind of military the the machinery of the military mm -hmm. detail kind of stuff yeah are you interested in this i wasn't interested in it but it didn't put me off because at this sure. point he's well established that he's if there's an opportunity to go over the top and explaining something very <laughs> minute it's he's going to just pounce on that yeah. opportunity. Whether it was in the opening chapter where we're talking about the billowing capes and the types of leather and cloth that, and all of this times. stuff. And, you know, and sometimes it works too. Like when he's describing Tyrion and the big helmet in the big battle, like it works at certain times. You just kind of, <laughs> you kind of come to assume that he's going to do it. And it's part of the, it's part of the magic at this point. Like, you're like okay, we're going to go, it. we're going to go in depth on this. He's, he's, he's earned the trust that it's going somewhere. Sure. He's explaining this for a reason. Like whether it's no, he's explaining the mythology of the world, the fantastical nature of the world, kind of in an assumed way, we like that. So I, I, I take it in that vein where he's like, okay, this is going somewhere. There's a reason he's doing this. He's not just, you know, it's not architecture right. porn for him. It's <laughs> that there's something here. That's true. I hear you. And, and I mean, the, there is a reason because this is a strategic castle that will be important in various points. Um. King of the North, uh, ale, right? Stout, there you go. Nice. <laughs> it's a in rousing review. Okay, um, really quick. So, just th this chapter, in addition to being like this uh, choosing spectacle, yeah. is, is Catelyn's homecoming. Mm -hmm. He's coming home, and there are some, I thought, some nice little understated affecting passages about, like, sh she, she, she hasn't been here since she was a little girl, yeah. like, since she was shipped off to the North to marry this weird Ned Stark guy. Mm -hmm. And she says things like, uh, the splash and rumble of the great water wheel. Was a sound from her girlhood that made a sad that brought a sad smile to Catelyn's face. <laughs> I I'll admit I'm a little. It's harder to read now that I've had a bit of this uh, delicious stout. <laughs> the delicious stout. And talking about um, laying in things that are important, she is remembering her girlhood, and she's and she says like some you know ancillary stuff. She also talks about how she and her sister Lysa, mm -hmm. like basically lost their kissing virginity playing doctor with Littlefinger when he was fostered here. Of course it's Littlefinger. Well, yeah, naturally. I mean, that's where he developed his lifelong crush on yep. Catelyn. But it's also very important because we know that Littlefinger and Lysa, that Lysa gets all obsessed with him, mm -hmm. and that's the reason he kind of has her in her, his pocket. Yeah. And then he goes over that scene where he pushes her to the moon door, and it'll be fun. It's a good time. It's classic. It is classic. So, and that's set up here. Like, but that's, he, he's planting the seed of, oh, Lysa yep. and Littlefinger had a thing going back yeah. in the day, and now we'll we'll see later how that developed in off screen for years, mm -hmm. and it ends up being a plot point. Yeah, and that's why like these chapters, they're I mean when he goes into detail like this and he explains things in an assumed way or it's like offhand, mm -hmm. it works because it's like oh I should know this <laughs> the, the way that you're describing this to me this is a nugget of information that right. I feel like I should already know it's out there it's not like it's, it's out a, there yeah. it's not a big revelation where it's like and then Littlefinger stole their kissing virginity or whatever and it's, <laughs> it's like it's not phrased like that it's I know just but it's, put it. it's funny phrasing but it's not this big reveal whereas that's the main part of the chapter it's still just a little nugget tucked away in this exactly. chapter yeah of other little nuggets just tucked away so that's why the window dressing didn't necessarily put me off. I recognized it, but it it's a hard thing to... to that's why, I like, the first Justice League movie, or Batman versus Superman, was garbage, because mm -hmm. it was window addressing for the first Justice League movie, but they're like, no, 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 you're seeing a Batman movie, and it's got Superman <laughs> in it. It's like, no, I'm actually seeing a commercial, a two-hour commercial I paid twelve fifty for <laughs> for the movie that's coming out in two years. This is an opportunity for him to set up more books, and he's not really using it in that same way where he's actually, you're getting valuable information out of this. You are getting things that move the story forward. You're not getting these little teases where you're like, what the hell? And then it just goes away. Or you're like, oh, that's a forced cameo. Like the end of the new uh, Harry Potter movie. I'm going to spoil it if nobody's seen it. See but it, like yeah. everybody's Shut talking up. about these spoilers that are tucked in at the end, and it feels like fan service. 
there's no fan service at this point, so obviously you can't do that. And I like it when you can approach a chapter where you need to set things up, mm -hmm. and it's a very apparent that you're setting things up for the next, like, we're not going to get resolved or resolution for, like, for two this. Like, books. Yeah. yeah, we're not getting resolution in the next 25 pages from this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be books from now. And to be able to do that and keep you intrigued and not feel like it's, it's a sellout chapter, I, I think that that's impressive. No, I do too. I completely agree with you. I think it's great because, I mean, like, it's a chapter about her remembering what to do as a young person. Yeah. So it totally works, just like she's remembering her stuff. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the trick of it is, with George R. R. Martin, you never know like what is incidental detail and what's important setup. Because mm -mm. he just kind of slips everything right in there. And it all just kind of flows pretty naturally. And he just slips something a really important detail in there, but you would never know. Because right? it's just part of the flow. Yeah. Which is great, because it, it, it feels more true to life, which I like. Yeah. Okay, beyond that, um, we get some Catelyn, uh, you know, character stuff. I liked her description of her alien father. Yep. I'm going to read it really fast before we go, because I thought it was affecting. <laughs> uh, her father is just, you know, toward the end, he's getting senile. Mm -hmm. he's, and uh, Hoster Tully had always been a big man, tall and broad in his youth, portly as he grew older. Now he seems shrunken, the muscle and meat melted off his bones. Even his face sagged. The last time Catelyn had seen him, his hair and beard had been brown, well streaked with gray, now they had gone white as snow. And just, you know, a nice little carefully observed uh, detail that I think can apply to anybody who's watched a grandparent or a parent or an aunt or an uncle. Kind of, you know, go, it happens. Mm -hmm. And just uh, lets you know that even if they live in fake medieval times, they can still <laughs> be relatable to people now. Yeah, it's timeless. Anything else you want to mention about this chapter, Josh? No. But we got one more left. So. We only have one more left in the Game of Thrones. The final Daenerys chapter is the been a long last journey. chapter. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've had a good time. It is. I'm ready for the you. next books. Yeah, it's nice that we don't there. have to actually wait for him to write it because a, it seems like <laughs> that's a that's a hell of a thing to wait for. Yeah, you, based on everybody's that, current wait for the next book. But... Hopefully, by the time we get through our series, it'll be out. Mm. Yes, yeah. to that. Really, really fast vocabulary. Really, really quick. Do you know what a thwart means? No. A cross. Oh. All right. There you, you got go. it. That's it. Your new vocabulary word for the day is a thwart. A thwart. It means a cross. Use that one in it's conversation. It's a stupid way to say a cross. If you want to say it in a dumb way, no one will understand. All right. <laughs> Next week, we go over the final chapter Oof. in A Game of Thrones. The final Daenerys chapter. It's a good chapter. She gets her freaking dragons. Yeah. That'll be a good time. Um, thank you to HBO for giving me King in the North stout i've enjoyed that quite a bit <laughs> thank you for Cheryl wassenaar for lending her uh expertise mm -hmm. thank you for all of you who watched of course it's gonna be back i i've missed you guys for a while and thanks to josh hill for more song than and josh right. cheers josh cheers to myself. <laughs> there right. it is see you guys next wednesday 4 p.m central on the winter's Queen facebook page adios